All right, let's turn tonight, if you will, please, to Matthew chapter number 24. We'll begin there and we'll go to several scriptures this evening. It is a blessing to be back in the house of the Lord tonight and thank God for the good service this morning. And we're praying God will help us tonight. Uh, we do covet your prayers as a church that the Lord will uh, guide us in these coming days. We've got some Sundays uh, coming up, and then uh, on toward the fall, uh, the schedule gets back at it, and I'm praying that everything will uh, uh, get back to the way uh, we have been. Uh, not that uh, I want to see uh, uh, just the humdrum. I want to see the doors open again. Amen? God opens and no man closes, and God closes and no man opens. And uh, we resign to that. Uh, one thing I've heard through all of this, Brother Lawson, uh, through all uh, preachers from everywhere, well, God's on the throne. God's on the throne. And the way he's orchestrating things, we need to realize that uh, he's got a great plan, and it will come to pass. And it's like Judas Iscariot. The Bible says about him that all offenses must come. Had to happen. But woe be unto the man by whom they come. We don't have to like what's going on. We don't have to agree with what's going on. But we have to acknowledge that God is putting a master plan together. And when it's all said and done, we're going to know that he's in charge. Amen. All right, Matthew 24, look down in verse number 37. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. As the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the meal, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Father, I pray you help us with the word of God tonight. And Lord, I pray you bathe this congregation with your spirit. For God, you bless the message, whatever means it goes out. However, folk hear this word, may we receive it as it truly is the word of our God. Lord, save the lost, put conviction upon their heart. And may the quickening power of the Holy Ghost deal with them tonight by your mercy. Pray, our Father, you'd revive, help, and encourage your people. And Lord, stir us up to the things of God. And for what you do, we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> the Lord Jesus is answering the disciples' question of when these things shall be. And uh, he gives several illustrations. He talks about the uh, parable of the fig tree, which has to do with Israel and we were noticing the sign as we came through the gate. This church established in 1949, uh, one year after Israel declared to be a nation, 1948. And the Lord said, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. And we're coming down to that. A generation can be 40 years. It can be up to 100 years. For they were in Egypt for four generations, and that was 400 and 30 years. We don't know exactly how long it is, but the Lord gave us some things to know and to look for uh, at the coming of the Son of Man. And one of these was, it's going to be as it was in the days of Noah, verse number 37, that as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And as I look at Noah's day uh, and nowadays, uh, they're lining up parallel. He gave another statement, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And if you study Lot, you study uh, how there was sodomy and sodomites, and that's where that word comes from, and it was wicked perversion uh, like you can't imagine. Uh, even when the angels came to get Lot, they, they, those men tried to uh, molest those angels, and God uh, protected them. And we're living in those days. We're not coming to it. It's worldwide. It's a, it's a phenomenon. It's a, it's a movement worldwide. And Jesus pegged it and said, Now, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And he gives us that other history lesson of as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming 
of the Son of Man. And I want to look at Noah tonight as an example for now. Noah, an example for now. <clears throat> now we go back in Genesis chapter number 6, and you can turn there if you will, please. And we see the description of the days of Noah. The Bible says that uh, the Lord's Spirit shall not always strive with man, for that also he is flesh, and yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. In other words, he says it's not going to be an open-ended project. Uh, there will come an ending of the time of my mercy of the generation of Noah, and we know that it happened. Noah preached for 120 years, then the flood came on the world of the ungodly. Again, the Lord said, I will build my church, and that's what he's doing now. And anybody that builds a building should have the intention of finishing that building. The church is not an open-ended, uh, continual project. The Bible talks about the ending of the times of the Gentiles. God has turned from Israel as a spiritual people, and he's turned unto the Gentiles, red, yellow, black, and white. They're precious in his sight. We're Gentiles. We're not of the Jewish people physically, but there are some Jewish folk that are saved by the grace of God. I've got good uh, friends that are preachers, and uh, man, what, what minds they have and hearts they have spiritually. But for the most part, the church is made up of Gentiles, and the Lord said, I'm going to call them out from the north, the south, the east, and the west, and I'm going to make up a number which no man can number called the church, and he likened it unto a building project. And one day, thank God, the last one's going to get saved, the final tax is going to be put in the roof. It's going to be finished, and the father's going to say to the son, it's time to go get the church. It's time to go get the bride. And just like there was a limited time of mercy and grace to the days of Noah, there's a limited time of the mercies of God upon this earth in regard to the church age. Now, the Scripture describes the days of Noah. Uh, it tells us in verse number 6 or verse number 5, that God saw the wickedness of man, that it was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Sound like they had the television and the Internet and the radio back then. Amen. Amen. The thoughts of the imagination of the heart were evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Bible tells us later on in this same chapter, uh, over in verse number uh, 11, that the earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Seen any violence in recent weeks and months in this past year? And it's not just here. It's everywhere. The rioting, the violence, the killing, the stabbings, the rapings, the robbings, and all of that. And then you got this crowd that wants to defund the police and back the thin blue line off, uh, calling for disaster, calling for chaos. Well, that's the days of Noah. The earth was filled with violence, and God looked upon the earth, for it was corrupted, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. There was a perversion of the ways of God. God had a message and a testimony that salvation would be through the blood of the Messiah that was to come, and yet the corruption of the ways of the religious ways were there upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And uh, you know the rest of the story, how the flood came upon the world of the ungodly. Now, the world still laughs at the story of Noah. They call it a fable. They call it a fictitious story. They call it an imagination of Christians. But we have the record in the book of Genesis that it literally happened. Then you have the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he testifies of a historical man by the name of Noah. And he brings us back to understand what happened in those pre-flood days and the message of Noah and how Noah was an example to us. Then we drop on over to 2 Peter. Turn it there, if you will, please. 2 Peter chapter number 3. And uh, Simon Peter is writing now of the last days. And he says in verse number 3, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, 
and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the Father fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. I was witnessing to a fellow one time and talking about the coming of the Lord Jesus. He said, oh, my grandma said that. She'd been dead a long time. I said, friend, you just fulfilled Scripture. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, the Bible says that in the last days they'd say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the Father fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning. I said, you just fulfilled Scripture. That's exactly what God said you would be saying. But Peter said, hang on a minute. All things did not continue from the creation till now in the same manner. He said, I want to remind you of the flood and of Noah and the message of Noah. In verse number 5, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that the word of God, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. He's talking about Noah's flood. And he said in these last days when the scoffers and the mockers would be around, that they would mock and laugh and be willingly ignorant of the worldwide flood. Now, these scientists say there's not enough water on the earth to cover all the mountains and the hills. I was sitting in Hyderabad, India, uh, at the church reading the Hyderabad Times, and uh, guess what? Those Indian scientists said, we have just discovered that there's more water under the earth than there is on the earth. And if it were all turned loose, it would flood the entire world. And these are Hindus, man. They don't believe what we believe. But we know the Bible says the fountains of the deep were unloosed. Not only that, the heavens came forth and gave forth the rain. And God sent a worldwide flood. Amen. And he said in the last days they would be willingly ignorant. Now I am not a scientist, but I do have two eyes and a brain, and I can see some things. Preaching out in West Texas, I climbed up on a mountain behind the church to have a little prayer meeting. And as I climbed up those rocky uh, ledges, I looked down and there were fossilized fish and seashells. I mean, you could get a tractor and trade a load of them if you want to. I looked over at the mountain straight across and you could see where waves had cut out the sides of the hills as the water abated. And this 500 miles to the nearest ocean there. Now, how did all that get there? Coulter and I were up in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and we went to see Ruby Falls. You got to see Ruby Falls. You know, I, I thought there's about a woman falling when I was a boy. See Ruby Falls. Why do I want to see Ruby Falls? But we went over there, and we went down uh, through the tunnel, and uh, the fellow's showing us to lag tights, to lag mites, and all of these things. And he takes his flashlight, and he shines it down on the floor of that cave, and here is a fossilized fish. He said, now, it's like 300 feet down to the river. said, how do you think this fish got up here and was fossilized? I said, uh, Noah's flood. He said, you got it. And then we just went on. Amen. <laughs> and everywhere you go, there are signs of a worldwide flood. I live near Lake Lure, North Carolina, and you can go there to Chimney Rock, they call it. And if you make your little circle around Chimney Rock, you look down in the valley, 1,000 feet below is Lake Lure. And they'll tell you in the big sign there, this chimney of rock was left behind because there was a big flood that came through here one day. And I'm thinking, man, she was a whopper. Amen. It's a thousand feet down there to the lake. And the flood that I know about is Noah's flood. And it carved it out. And there are places like that all over the world. I preached in Turkey and got to talk to some folk that were there near Mount Ararat. And uh, I asked them, I said, do you really believe that there was a man by the name of Noah and the flood and the ark and all that? They said, why, sure. I said, we know there is. We know where the ark's at. And said, uh, you may not know this, but said there are all kind of evidences of where uh, the trail that the ark left behind. Uh, the ark had uh, weight counterweights on each side. It was big stones to keep it from flipping over. And they found these great big stones with, with holes through them where the ropes were at. And one would be here, one would be on down the way, one would be further. And as he got closer to the mountains, Noah cut them off and it left behind a trail as it headed up there to the mountain and it rested there on the mountain. And I said, why don't you do these archaeological digs? They said, you think the Muslim government's going to allow that? There's absolutely no way. 
prevent anybody with any scientific mind at all can look physically and see that there has been water scars and marks all over this world. But we don't want to believe that because if we believe that and we believe the worldwide flood, then we have to believe that there's a God and we have to believe that there wasn't a big old smiley face on the side of the ark that said God loves you. We have to understand God is angry with the wicked every day. And he that believeth not is going to be condemned. And not only is he a God of love, he provided an ark and a way of salvation, but he also is a God of wrath. And that message was plainly preached to all the world in the days of Noah. But God said in the last days they would be willingly ignorant of that. Now, I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter number 11. And let's see how old brother Noah survived. How in the world is a man going to live for God among a generation like he lived for God? God gives us one verse. It is a plain, concise verse that summarizes the life of Noah. That's one thing I love about Hebrews chapter number 11. God gives abbreviated summarizations of these lives that took hundreds and hundreds of years, and yet God brings out the pertinent points and the way that they survived and how God used them as an example to serve the Lord. Look in verse number 7. The Bible says, By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Noah served God and survived by faith. Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith upon the earth? Will he find people that are believing God, that are resting on his promise? that know the Lord is true and his word will be fulfilled. There's so many that have walked away from the word of God and walked away from the promises of God. But thank God for God's remnant that still believes the Lord and says, uh, God said it, that settles it, whether the world ever believes it or not, and I'm going to stay with God and I'm going to believe God. And if you and I are to survive in these hours, we cannot lay our faith aside and start living on philosophy. We cannot be engulfed by fear. We have to believe God and trust God and rest in Him. Because if the devil can wrest your faith away from you, then he has just destroyed your shield that quenches all the fiery darts of the wicked. In Ephesians 6, in that armor, the Lord said, Take in the shield of faith whereby you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And the wicked are throwing fiery darts at God's children from every side. But we do like the Lord Jesus did when he was tempted in the wilderness. Every time Satan threw a fiery dart at it, he just picked up the shield of faith and said, It is written. And that fiery dart was extinguished. And we go right back to the written word of God. Now, your feelings will change. Your emotions will change. The devil will play on your mind. But the Word of God will never change. It is settled in heaven. And it's the only thing that God has put above his throne. And that is the Word of God. He's attached his name to it. He's attached his character to it. And you can mark it down. The Word of God will survive. Regardless of what you think, it really doesn't matter to me. But when they tried to burn that church building down in protest in Washington, D.C., and 60-some Secret Service men were hurt, and they tried to overrun the White House and all that, and they were stopped. And the next day when our president walked out and walked down there to that church building and stood in front of it, and he just simply held the holy, he turned it where he could read it, the holy Bible up, it set the dogs barking all across this country. Didn't have to say a word. Just hold up the Holy Bible. And I believe God put it in his heart to announce to the devil, you've tried to kill it. You've tried to burn it out. You've tried to destroy it. You've tried to stop it for these last 6,000 years. But it ain't going to happen, praise God. The Word of God is going to prevail over all that the devil's going to do and going to try to do. Hallelujah. Amen. 
By faith. By faith. You're going to have to trust God and believe God. That's how Noah got there. But Noah, I haven't seen a drop of rain. By faith. But no, nobody's listening to what you're saying. You're spitting in the wind, man. They're, they're not getting it by faith. But no, nobody's joining to help you. You're, you're here all by yourself. You and your three boys building it by faith. Amen. He just stayed with it, and he trusted God and believed God, and we see the end result. Now notice, number one, the warning of God. Verse 7 says, by faith Noah being warned of God. And it was a warning of faith, and God has put many warnings in his word. The Lord Jesus in Matthew 24 said, You be ready. You live in such a fashion as to look for the coming of the Son of Man. You be prepared. He said, If the goodman of the house had known what hour the thief would come in, he had not suffered it to be broken up, but he would have been ready. He talked about the virgins, and ten were wise, ten were filled. He said, Be ready. Be ready. You know not what hour the Lord's going to come. And when God warned Noah, he says, prepare and be ready. Amen. And there are many warnings. There's a warning that Jesus is going to return. Amen. And his return is in two aspects. There is the rapture and the revelation. And the rapture is the catching away of the church. The Bible plainly tells us that the Lord Jesus will return in the clouds and with the voice of the archangel, the dead in Christ shall rise first and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together in the moment, the twinkling of an eye, this corruption will put on incorruption, this mortal will put on immortality and we will be seized forcibly and taken unto himself. It's going to happen. Now, the word rapture is not in the Bible, but the word catching away is. And some folks say, well, I don't believe in the rapture because the word rapture is not in the Bible. Well, the word Bible is not in the Bible either. Amen. But we know what he's talking about, don't we? And we know what the catching away is. And we understand as God's people, Jesus said, I'm going to come and get my church. And he said, it'll be like a thief in the night. A thief doesn't come to get your garbage. The thief, thief doesn't come to steal the dog bowl. He comes to get the jewels and the riches. You are called God's jewels, God's treasure, God's riches, and one day he's coming after his church, hallelujah, and I'm headed out of here. Amen. Seven years later, after great tribulation upon this earth, and it's going to be hell on this earth, you think she's bad now? This is just a little trial run for old Mr. Antichrist. You notice how fast all the world was moved by an invisible force? Countries literally shut down. I scheduled to go to Australia. They shut the whole country down. Many countries just absolutely shut down, locked down over this invisible enemy that came upon us that fast. And uh, boy, they're hunting and they're searching. We need one man. We need somebody to lead us. We've got to have answers in all this. And these things are coming together so fast. Now they're talking about that when they do get these, uh, uh, these inoculations, that if you don't get the inoculation, then you can't travel. You've got to have the mark or you've got to have the chip. You've got to have something in your passport that if you're not inoculated, you're not going into Australia. You've got to have it. You're not bringing that stuff here. And you can imagine how fast it'll be. No, you can't go in Walmart without a mask. I stopped the other day. You can't come in here without a mask. One of these days it'll be, you can't come in here without a mark. You can't buy. You can't sell. Uh, you've got to have it. And we're seeing just, just through this coronavirus how fast people are about, oh, oh, okay, that's right. Well, that's a good idea. You know, we all need to do that. I, I want to submit to that. And it's the spirit of Antichrist and the attitude of people who are so mellow and such snowflakes in this hour that they're willing to swallow hook, line, and sinker anything this godless government. Oh, you churches out there in California, oh, no, you can't sing. You can't praise God. You can't be chanting any prayers. No, 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 no. Now, it's all right to get out there and scream and holler and burn buildings. It's all right to do all of that. But don't you come to church. Don't you dare do that. Well, you know, I believe we ought to follow the leadership of the government. And I believe. And people just melt right into it. Thank God for folk that are bucking up on this saying, uh-uh. No, not here. Not yet. There's still a few red-blooded Americans that say, hey, you're not taking away our First Amendment. And they want to choke us down. And say, if you disagree with us, we'll ruin your business. 
We'll uh, blast your house. We'll break your windows. We'll burn you down if you disagree with us. That's communism. Go try to have a street meeting and preach on the street in China and see how long they allow you to have freedom of speech. And this communist crowd, they want to shut the mouth of anybody that is in opposition unto them. And we've got dumb dogs all across this country that will not bark and men that have yielded themselves under the whims of this old world. But Noah said, oh, no, God gave me a warning, and I'm going to tell you what he told me. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. It was a warning of faith. It was a warning of future not seen as yet. Noah, you say it's going to rain. Uh, what's rain? They didn't know what rain was. It never rained on the face of the earth. There was a mist that came up out of the ground. The earth was in a terrarium type uh, situation. That's why the vegetation was big. People lived to be so old. Ultraviolet rays were screened out and all of that. Yeah. But God said it's going to rain. Well, what, what's rain? It's little bitty droplets of water that will come out of the sky. And there will be so many of these little bitty droplets of water out of the sky that it's going to flood the whole earth. Oh, uh -huh. the sky is falling. Little droplets of water. Have you ever seen it rain, Noah? Uh, no. How do you know it's going to? Because God said it would. Right. Amen. Amen. I've never seen a rapture. I've never seen a resurrection. I've never seen somebody change in a moment of the of the corruption, putting on incorruption, more putting on immortality. I've never seen all that. I've never seen the Lord in the clouds calling away his church. But I know it's coming. Amen. 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 Things not seen as yet. And then we see it was a warning, my friend, of fear. The Bible said Noah moved with fear. When he heard that, when he saw that, he said, I better get with it. And it was a good fear that motivated him to cut timber and build the ark and to do what God wanted him to do. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. People don't fear God in this hour. You hear that lemons guy the other day, and he is a lemon. On CNN said, well, Jesus Christ never claimed to be perfect. Yeah. Oh, really? Is that right? What Bible's he reading? He must be reading that neutered Bible or that, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know what he's reading, but he sure ain't reading the Bible. He didn't get it from the Word of God. And yet these folk, they want to deny who the Lord is and allow the way and try to teach us and tell us the Word of God, and they don't know a, a bit about it. Oh, no. Oh, no one knew that it was the fact of God, and he moved with fear in his heart. He said, I believe God, and I fear God. Amen. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And then it was a warning of force. Well, no, that's just your opinion. Situation ethics. Well, now, I know that we're different. You believe this, and I believe that. And I know it's totally opposite, but because you believe that, you're right. And because I believe what I believe, I'm right. So we're both opposite, and neither one of us are wrong. We're both right. Now, what kind of sense does that make? And yet, that's the philosophy they're trying to ram down our throat today. There is right, and there is wrong. There is good, and there is evil. There's God, and there's devil. There's truth, and there's lie. And my friend, there's no middle ground whatsoever, but we've made it a hodgepodge of a mixture of gray, of truth and error, of right and wrong and all that, so that everybody just all mixed up into a big nothingness. But Noah said, I'm telling you, I believe God It's going to rain. Judgment is going to come. Well, you're just too harsh. You're judgmental, Noah. You're judging us. Get out here, get your little sign. Stand there at the edge of Walmart. Uh, the Lord's coming, you know, prepare to meet God. A uh, little one about hell or heaven, and here's here they come across the parking lot. And this is about the only verse they know. Judge not, ye be not judged. Had a fellow holler that at me one time. I said, are you judging that I'm judging? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yeah, you judge all the time, don't you? You ladies, when you buy groceries and they've sat in the car a little long and you put that chicken out on the counter, you take your nose and you, you get a little sour whiff out of that, you're judging, mm, I might not ought to cook this. I better just take the loss and chunk it because I'm going to feed my children salmonella. You judgmental thing, you. 
Or you judge him when you pull up to a stop sign and there's a car he's down the way, but man, is he going real fast? Is he going slow? Can I get out? Can, should I sit right here? Should I let him go by? Or I, you're judging. Judging means a verdict, favorable or unfavorable. And you're saying here is what I assume to be so or be right. Now, a reprobate don't have the ability to judge. That's what the word reprobate means, the inability to make a proper moral choice. Right. And man, are we seeing reprobates in our society? Yeah. We got a reprobate for a governor in North Carolina. Yeah. Mr. Cooper don't know if a man's to go in a boy's bathroom or he's to go in a girl's bathroom. And he signed off on that. And if you don't know which bathroom to go into, you're a reprobate. And friend, all of these, all of these judgments that are coming out that are to you and me, they're totally ludicrous. I mean, they're nuts. You say, how in, in the world can anybody believe that? They, they do believe that because they do not have the ability to make a proper moral choice. They've been turned over. Romans chapter number one, to a reprobate mind, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. And there is a downhill slot in all of that. And the end of the way is a reprobation. And we're seeing that evidence all across this country. Well, the days of Noah were days when men were being turned over to a reprobate mind. They would not believe, they would not bow, and they would not repent. The warning of God, they resisted that warning. But then the waiting of God, 1 Peter 3, 20, the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. Now Noah's an example. 120 years he built that ark. It didn't take him and that, those boys 120 years, those three boys. You can build a lot of things in 120 years. But I believe God slowed their building project down. And I believe the Lord slowed the process down because the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. Gave him another opportunity, another year. The oldest man in Bible history is a man by the name of Methuselah, 969 years old. He was the son of Enoch, the seventh from Adam, the prophet of the pre-flood days. And you can read Enoch's message in the book of Jude, and his message fits our day. When Enoch was 65 years old, this baby was born. God said, name him Methuselah. Methuselah means when he is dead, it shall be sent. Right. He was God's prophetical timepiece that was clicking along in the days of Noah. And the year that Methuselah died is the year that the flood came on the world of the ungodly. Right. God had a timepiece clicking right along. 969 years. Can you imagine having a birthday cake with that many candles on it. He had to have a fire extinguisher to put them out. I'm talking about a man that's singing, I've been waiting, waiting on that shore. Long I've traveled, ain't gonna travel no more. Shades of evening falling. My steps are getting slow. Lord, I've been waiting, waiting, Lord, to go. And I imagine he said, how much longer, Lord? And the Lord said, just a little longer. I'm gonna wait just a little longer. My long suffering is being merciful. 120 years in the days of Noah, 969 years in Methuselah's life, but there came an end to it. There came a day when the door was closed and no man could open it. The waiting of God. You say, you know, preacher, we're in this uh, new millennial. We're already in the 20th year of this new millennial. You say, why has he not come yet? All I can say is the long suffering of God has been waiting. He may be waiting on you to get saved. He may be waiting on you to repent and get right with God. God may be merciful just for you that you might repent of your sins and trust Him. And when that last one, and I don't know the number which no man can number, nobody does, but God. But when the last one is saved, then the church is going out of here. God's been merciful. How long has He been waiting on you? He may not wait 120 years. He may not wait 120 days. You don't know when you're going to meet God. Amen. Young lady driving down the highway yesterday morning, got rear-ended, killed, went into eternity just fast as you could snap your fingers. We hear of it all the time. You don't have promise of another breath, of another day, 
That's why God said today is the day of salvation and now is the accepted time. And if God has waited on you one minute, he's waited on you one minute longer than you deserve. He waited on me a whole lot longer than I deserved, but he stretched out his hand all the day long. And if you're stretching your hand out, that means you're making extra effort. God's made extra effort to get the gospel to some of you. You need to be saved. Do not take for granted you'll have tomorrow or you'll have another day, the waiting of God. But then we see the way of God. God said, build an ark, Noah. Noah built an ark. Rooms therein, the animals got on board, and he gave the call, get on board. And I want to say God had a way. Men may have had their ways. They may have had the unsinkable Titanic. Oh, they may have had the Bismarck. They may have had some other great ship there, but none of them survived the storm. But there was one ship. It was a crude ark that was built out of gopher wood. It would not have passed the inspector's uh, inspection of Asha. They'd have turned her down said, no, you're going to have to do something else because it only had one door in the side of it, one door. They didn't need two doors. Need, didn't need exit ramps, one door. And you know, this way of salvation has one door, and that one door is Jesus. Did he not make it so clear and so plain? When Thomas said, we don't know the way. How are we going to get there? The Lord said, here it is. Now listen real close. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Amen. Yet, I'm on an airplane. I witnessed to a Jewish fella. And he says, well, you know, said so that guy over there, he's a Muslim, and I'm a Jew and you're a Christian. Just said, so long as we are sincere about what we believe, we'll be all right. I witnessed to a Muslim guy out of Pakistan. You know what he said to me? He said, well, that guy may be a Jew. You might be a Christian. I'm a Muslim. But, you know, as long as you're sincere, you'll be all right. I got off an airplane down here in Charlotte, North Carolina, witness to the lady that was directing traffic there. We're just standing there, and she said, well, you know, I, I'm really not a churchgoer or whatever, but said it don't really matter what you believe just so long as you're sincere. I said, I sure am glad that pilot wasn't just sincere. I'm glad he knew where he was going and how to get me here. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Amen. And they say, well, Jesus was just a good prophet. And I always ask them, well, will a prophet lie? Well, absolutely not. Well, here's what Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father by me, but by me. And you know that ark door? Oh, this is such a message. The little ant came through that door, and the mighty elephant came through that door. The kangaroo hopped through that door, and the buzzard flew through that door. All the different critters of creation didn't matter what they were. If they were saved, they had to enter in through the same door. Hallelujah. And it doesn't matter what race, what tribe, what kindred, what kinship, what uh, neighborhood you're out of, what social rank you are, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you're smart, whether you're dumb, whether you're healthy, whether you're weak, it really doesn't matter. There's one door that you have to enter in, and that is by faith in the Lord Jesus. Nicodemus said, he said, Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. How can I be born again? You can be born again by trusting and the Son of Man who will be lifted up. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And that is the only way. And people tried other ways, but it didn't work. And people will try other ways in this hour, but it won't work. But if you'll trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, thank God you can know peace beyond understanding, forgiveness of your sins, and you can enter in. For Jesus hath prepared the way. There is a way. Lastly, there was wrath. The Bible tells us that God said, Come down, Noah. And Noah went in, his family, and nobody else wanted it. God shut the door. And when God shut the door, the opportunity was over. Boy, those words, too late. Too late. Too late. Hey, let's go out to eat. Let's run over here to uh, the Golden Corral. And you grab us a steak, and you get there right as the fellas. Clicking it, too late. Sorry, sir, we're closed. Too late. Boy, the sad thing is it's going to be too late for a lot of folk that finally wake up to it. Everybody's going to believe in God. 
Old Oliver B. Green used to say, five seconds in hell and you're going to be one of the greatest believers that there is. But it's not going to help you then. It's going to be too late. There is no purgatory. There is no halfway place. There is no, well, I'll change my mind when I see God. It's not going to happen. You have to believe on him here and you have to believe on him now. And when this wrath came, it came fast. All of a sudden it started raining. The fountains of the deep began to shake. The earth began to quake. The rapid muddy water of the wrath of God began to flow down through the mountainside. I'm sure they jumped in their four-wheel drives and uh, their fastest steeds and ran to the mountaintops and climbed up. But the water rose and swept them all away. Well, one of these days, preacher, I'll get right with God. You don't know if you'll have one of these days. It was fast. It was fierce. Nobody could escape it. It was in Savunga, Alaska, preaching to the Eskimos out on that island off the coast of Nome whenever that uh, tsunami came and hit Japan. They're the most prepared country for tsunamis in the world. And it showed it over and over again, that big wall of water coming in there. And it just washed right over their barriers, washed right down through that community, took whole buildings and communities and just washed them away. Just like that. Didn't matter how fast your car was. They had heard the sirens and the warnings, but the judgment came faster than all the warnings. You'll not outrun the wrath of God. You say, well, I'll hide in all that crowd. Oh, no, God knows your name. Amen. He's got the very hairs on your head numbered. And as an individual, we all shall stand and appear before the judgment bar of God. Amen. And the question will be, what did you do with Jesus? Amen. And it's going to come so forceful, nobody's going to be able to keep you from that day. Then, my friend, it was fatal. There wasn't one escaped unless they were on board the ark. Not one. I saw the dead, both small and great. They stood before God, and the books were open. And whosoever's name was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. They, this will be the second death where they'll be tormented day and night forever and forever. See, God's a holy God. He cannot, he will not, he shall not tolerate sin. And your sin is against an eternal God. It's a transgression against an eternal holy God. And your sin will be judged in one of two places. Either you can bow your knee to the Lord Jesus and trust him as your Lord and Savior and have your sins washed away by faith in the blood, or the Bible says ye shall die in your sins. And the fearful and the unbelieving and the whoremonger and the abominable, they'll all have their part in the lake of fire. He that delivered me unto thee shall have the greater condemnation and the wrath of God will be outpoured and it'll be an eternal wrath forever and forever and forever. And this is not a dark age theology. This is right out of this blessed old Bible. Amen. That's why the scoffers and the mockers they go off like barking dog, cussing and raving, slobbering. When you just raise the word of God, you don't have to say a thing. Because we'll all answer to this blessed old book that God has given us. But I want to say that it was a fair judgment. God, it's not fair. I'm on this mountain and the water, it's not fair. God, whoa, hang on, whoa, whoa, stop, stop. Let's rewind the tape. It'll take a while, but let's rewind it. 120 years, right over there on the hillside, CNN visited them. All the fake news came by and checked him out. And What are you building this uh, zoo for in your backyard? You got a permit for all this? What's this all about? Well, the judgment of God's going to come and it's, it's going to rain. <laughs> yeah, it's going to rain. Well, I didn't understand the message. You didn't us Let's rewind the tape now. It's going to rain, it's going to rain, it's going to rain, it's going to rain. Noah played his song on one string of his guitar. It's going to rain, going to rain, going to rain, going to rain. Get you a new tune, man. Get with it. We've all, you, why do you always preach it's going to rain? Judgment's coming, it's going to rain. Because it's going to rain. Judgment's are coming. <laughs> clear and plain. And the message of the gospel is real clear and it's real plain. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. 
That's real clear and that's real plain. This judgment was fair. But then it was fatal and final. You got eternity to think about. You know, I have to wear these masks. I've thought about developing some masks and put on it. Coronavirus, 1.0%, you will die of corona if you get it. 100% chance you will die of sin because the wages of sin is death. Amen. There is a cure for sin. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He that believeth upon me shall never die. You die physically but not eternally. You'll live forever and forever and forever. And everybody is scared to death of this Disease that only a small fraction of the people that even get it are going to die. But are you not afraid of the sin that's dwelling in your veins? It's proof. It's a dangerous world. The wages of sin is death. Nobody has ever escaped this world alive except Enoch and Elijah. And I believe they're going to come back preaching the tribulation, have to go through it themselves. Amen. Because it's appointed unto men once to die. And after this, the judgment. Well, we close out with this thought of the winners of glory. The Bible said, Noah became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Amen. Sam, Ham, and Japheth, his three boys, hung in there with him. Daddy, why can't we go out and party with the rest of this crowd? Look what all we're missing, boy. Just hanging there with God. It's going to be worth it all. Amen. And then one day the flood came, and the ark landed, and they took the covering off the ark, and they settled down. Noah built a fire and he offered sacrifice and had a worship service before the Lord. Beforehand, he had the smallest church in the whole world. Now Noah's got the largest church in the whole world. And I can see him sitting around the fire. And Ham, Sham, Javis said, now what, Daddy? He said, well, boys, you see any no trespassing signs? You see any register of deeds anywhere? It all belongs to you. It's yours. You've inherited the whole earth. It belongs to you. You've stayed in there with God. Now look, God's given it all to you. We're heirs of God, joint heirs of the Lord Jesus Christ, and God has given it all to us. And one of these days, and you've got to remember this world's not our home. This is not our kingdom, but there is a kingdom coming. Hallelujah. Noah, an example for now. Let's stand all over the house. Brother, you come get us a song. If you're here tonight and you've never been saved, you're not sure you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're redeemed, that you're saved, I'd encourage you to get in this altar and beg the Lord to save you. If you're watching this by internet or television or however the message gets out and you are not saved, the time is nigh. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, Now's your opportunity to be saved. Now's the day of salvation. Don't pass it by and don't take for granted you'll have another opportunity. And as God's children, let's be about our Father's business. Time's running out for us to be a witness and a testimony. What number we got, brother? Page 132 in the All-American Church hymnal. 132. Let's sing it out. You want to come pray, whatever the burden, whatever the matter might be on your heart. I beseech you to obey the Lord tonight as we sing. Amen. While life's dark maze I tread And griefs around me spread Be thou my guide Bid darkness turn sorrows tears away oh let me ever stray from thee aside she continues to play let's bow our heads and hearts as these are praying here in the altar seeking the Lord's face pray for this precious lady drove 12 hours to get here hungry for something from God today Got to talk to her a while this morning. You pray for her. She gets what God wants her to have here in this altar. Seek the Lord's face.
Father, we plead the blood of Jesus. God, I thank you for this service, this privilege to preach the message you've given us. I pray it not fall on their fears, but may it be effectual in its workings. And Lord, I pray in Jesus' name you'd touch the lost. May they be saved by the grace of God. Lord, I pray that today would be the day of salvation for some precious soul. Lord, I pray you'd revive us, your people. Help us, God, to be encouraged as Noah to persevere, to plod on, to continue on, knowing that it'll be worth it all at the end of the journey. Lord, our eyes are upon you, and we ask you to help us today now. For Jesus' sake we pray. Heads are bowed, and eyes are closed. She's continuing to play.